learning experience is going to be horrible today, right? You can't prepare, we went for a lecture, uh, but oh, no, starting 10 minutes late. This is why people decided to say, no, I'm going to break away, I'll form my own country. This is how it starts, right? I'll break away because Zambia is a mess. Um, yeah, well, I mean, that's what people, but how do, why do you think people do that, right? I'm not saying I'm going to break away. Oh, I'm breaking away. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to register my own university and have control of it. Now, I'm not as stupid and dumb, but um, I realize that it's, um, it's an odious, it would be an odious task, but I don't know. It's sad. Here's to hoping the recording won't be muffled today, but just in case. Ooh. Okay, uh, again, I, I do apologize for the confusion. Uh, on behalf of the department, on behalf of UNS, I sincerely apologize for uh, the breaking transmission. Guys, we continue off with um, with um, with where we left off. Uh, no announcements, really. Just to mention that uh, I, I, I clarified that the the quiz actually is a tech home. So we weren't going to have an in-class quiz because, in fact, we had forgotten that uh, we we're supposed to or meant to have a quiz on MIPS procedures. So it will be another tech home. We shall have a, a day or two, I suppose, to you know work on it and then submit it. It won't be that complex. Um, so, same approach as quiz, uh, take home quiz number 17. Um, but of course, the reminder, guys, that uh, test Friday next week. And we, maybe, I don't know if people would want us to have just, well, we'll have just a quick rundown on Wednesday on what to expect in the, um, in the test. Uh, and there's no makeup this week because Apparently, math majors have, have, have a test or something. Right, so we continue off with our discussion of uh, the so-called MIPS data path and control, apparently. And, and we, 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 we actually got to a stage where we discussed what the, the register file, the purpose of the register file is, uh, the purpose of the ALU, uh, at least with regards to R formatted instructions. Uh, and in fact, we even went so far as to, to really walk through a simulation of the typical R formatted instruction and we use the add instruction as an example. Granted, um, even though the hardware components that tend to be used by these so-called R formatted instructions um, are typically the same, but, but, but for some, well, the path, the actual path, specific path that the different instructions take might be slightly different. So for instance, if you're working with an and operation as opposed to an add operation, um, and, uh, as part of the tutorial, I, th I think uh, there'll be a simulation similar to the ad, but it will be more specific to a different type of uh, R formatted instruction. Um, maybe we'll use a logical and or or something, I don't know. Right. But fundamentally, we, we have an appreciation of why this is there, why this is there, why this is there, why this is here. And incidentally, this part here is applicable to I format instructions, J format instructions, and R format instructions. Why? Because irrespective of the instruction, you must fetch the instruction you wish to execute from memory, right? And then it's going to be found out the different uh, components depending on the type of instruction. Right, so the process is the same here where you, the program kind of is gonna point to the next, next instruction to be executed and then once this is fetched, um, uh, at the same time it's being fetched, a copy is sent to the adder and four is added to that value so that it points to the next instruction. This is how you point to the next instruction. And, and, and really the reason we, we are using four is because for MIPS at least, memory is byte addressable, it's weight aligned, right? So those, for you to get to the next chunk of 32 bits, because an instruction is 32 bits long, once you execute those 32 bits, for you to transition to the next 32 bits, you must add eight bytes, you must add uh, four bytes, right? Four times eight is 32, so you'll get to the next chunk of 32 bits, right? This is why there's a plus four here. Um, so 
Sorry? On the other? Yeah. Sorry? What what type of? I don't think I understand the question, sir. And? And? and But I just said this, I said irrespective of the instruction, these components here are used by R, 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 I, and J format instructions. Yeah, why? Because no matter what type of instruction you're working with, you must fetch it from mem main memory. And these, these three components here facilitate the fetching process. This is ID, remember those five stages? ID, I mean, sorry, IF, ID, um, execute, uh, Memory, right? Mem or memory read or write, and then you have write back, register write back, right? It's five stages. Uh, so it's all of them, that's the answer to your question. Okay, so now that we understand how this so-called thing works, uh, we're gonna transition to this so-called I format instructions, right? Um, right, so fundamentally really when it comes to I format instructions, the, at least for MIPS, the core elements that are utilized by I format instructions are these four elements here. Obviously the register file, right? Uh, uh, because um, at some stage you need to make reference to uh, the operands. It could be one, in this case maybe it's at least one operand, right? Think of add I for instance. Think of add I for instance, right? You still, you still, need, you still, need, you still, you still need to get as input a source register, right? Uh, so you need the register file, and in certain instances you need the AOU as well. Why? Because for certain operations might involve, certain operations, certain I format instructions might involve uh, performing arithmetic operations, a la add I, sub I, and I, or I, right? Um, B and E. Yes, right. Um, and then also the other component that we discuss at length here is the so-called sign, sign extension and sign extent. Um, and, and, and in the past we've, we've actually made mention of the fact that this is important because if you, if you remember the segmentation of the bits for an I format instruction, we said that the last 16 bits are reserved for the immediate value, right? Um, and and if, if that immediate value is going to be used as part of some computation, we know that it needs to be reconciled to the expected bit representation for a typical uh, MIPS data, right? Which is 32 bits. So the sign extension effectively converts this 16 bit value into equivalent 32 bits value, right? This is why you need that, so we'll discuss this at length. Um, and really, if you, if you look at these four components, right, we already know what, how the register files work, we already know how the ALU works, right, we already know how the memory works, right, both the instruction memory and data memory, same concept, really. Um, but the question is, how exactly does this sign extension or sign extend hardware component actually work? It turns out it's quite simple, really, right? So what the sign ex ex extension or sign extend does is it takes in as input a 16-bit value, and then it converts it into a 32-bit value, equivalent value. How does it do this? It gets the 16-bit representation of the immediate value, and then uh, pads that value with 16, or prefixes 16, um, uh, 16 bits that are equivalent to the most, the most significant bit on the, well, the most, the, uh, the, the last most significant bit, right? least significant bit, most significant bit, right? So the way the sign extend works is you get the, the, uh, more, the, the bit that's, uh, uh, the most significant bit here, which is here, 
And then you use this to um, kind of like pack the value with 16 of those um, entities or entries. Like in this case, you notice that we are padding uh, this value with 16 zeros so that we come up with 32 bits. And really, uh, if you were to convert this value to decimal and this value to decimal, you get the same answer. Right. So just a simple example here, just try and uh, kind of reinforce what we just uh, discussed here. Let's, uh, we're still using the same example here. So one of the very first instructions was we are loading the value 50 into register eight. This is standard practice. Um, we know how to decode this, it's pretty easy here. But, but you notice that um, as this instruction is fetched, obviously the immediate value is going to be found out to this particular uh, section of the data path, right? The 16 bits. So the 16 bits are fed into the sign extension, the sign extend as input, right? Of course, this is not the actual decimal value. It has to be um, the binary equivalent of the value you're working with, right? in this case, 50. Um, and then once it, uh, it's processed by the sign extend, you end up with, um, this is 32 bits. Makes sense why this is the case, because for instructions like the add i, you know that this value is potentially going to have to be maybe added somewhere, right? And in fact, if you remember this particular example, add i dollar sign eight zero fifty is part of this small little program here. So in fact, the value in eight is going to be used in this computation here, the add uh, dollar sign 10, comma, 8, comma, 9. This needs to be 32 bits in size, right? Because it's, it's going to be, in this particular case, it's going to be fed into the ALU as an operand to the ALU, right? It has to be 32 bits in size. Um, hopefully that makes sense. <coughs> so you come up with that. <coughs> and, and, and I just wanted to mention something here. Uh, a reminder, actually, that, that uh, at some stage we, meant, we made mention of the fact that MIPS actually represents data using two's complement. So in fact, the, the binary equivalent numbers we're talking about here are represented using two's complement. So if you're dealing with numbers, um, all, all those numbers are encoded using two's complement. And we know the process of converting a number to two's complement, right? But this is a very vision. But, so you notice here, if, if this value though was negative 50 instead of positive 50 here. Um, what we would have to do here is we go through the same process. The negative 50 is going to be found out here, but obviously negative 50 needs to be represented using um, a 16 bit representation in two's complement, which this is negative 50 in two's complement. Same process, right? Convert the 50 into decimal, right? So you, con you convert the 50 into decimal, um, and then you flip the bits. After you flip the bits, you add one. Once you add one, once you go through that process, you shall end up with this value here. Like the two, uh, two's complement representation of negative 50. Um, but once this is passed to the sign extend component, uh, the, right, the most significant bit is used to, um, to provide values for, 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 for the remaining 16 bits here. Which is why, ladies and gentlemen, oh guys, which is why, we see this when we, are, when we are doing these things, if we are to load this instruction, same exact instruction, right? Um, zero, negative 50. And I'll save this, uh, I'll call this sign extend, I guess. Observe, if I, and I, I think we've gone through this already, but for the benefit of those that have forgotten about this, if, if we load this in, in, in MIPS, I'll call it, uh, in QT spin. Sorry. Let it burn. So we are, we are wanting to load the negative 15 to the register 8, right? If we execute this, ignore that, we have negative 50 quite right, but what the computer sees is. Um, in register eight, this value here, right? So I don't know if people can see this, right? The, 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 the two's complement representation of, of negative 50 once it passes through the sign extend, 32 bits, right? 
Uh, and this can be a bit tricky because when you're dealing with integer values, right? If, so if you, you, if you decided to include the other part here, uh, the positive 50, you won't, because of how QTSPIN is implemented, you will not see the, that's uh, silly, you will not see the, you will not see all the 32 bits. Do you understand what I mean, this thing? Right, so don't be misled when you're, when you're, when you're trying these things out and, and you're like, oh, but this guy was telling us, oh, here's his 16-bit representation. Uh, why is it that this thing is not being represented using 32 bits? The reason is simple, because the leading zeros are more or less like irrelevant, right? We had a discussion about this. So when you're computing some, some, some binary numbers and the answer is, oh, I found the answer that's uh, zero, zero, using eight-bit representation, one, zero, zero. This, this is literally the same as as this, because the leading zeros have, have no influence on the value itself, the magnitude of the number. Do you understand this? The leading ones, though, are important. Hmm? The leading ones are important, though. Think about this, for not the leading zeros. Go and uh, try and convert. I know how to do this. I was going to say, go and try and convert this back to, I guess, go home, get this value, which is negative 50, using 32 bit representation, convert it into decimal from binary, right? Bearing in mind that this is uh, using tools complement. We know the process is steps we follow, and then convert the equivalent 16-bit um, representation of the number. Guys, the other thing here to mention, even though these are, this is not per se specific to, this is clear, it's not per se specific to I format instructions alone, but they are important for I formatted instructions. These hardware components called the multiplexers, right? Or max, as for sure, max. Um, so you notice that in the data path, you probably see there's a max here, there's a max here, a multiplexer here. So the question is, what is their role, right? It turns out that uh, as you're processing this, this 32-bit instruction, um, there are certain instances when you might want to explicitly decide on what decision needs to be made, right? So a, a nice way of thinking about this is um, a situation where you're dealing with uh, an R format instruction and an I format instruction that writes data to a register. Remember that for R format instructions, the bit segments that is res responsible for the register destination is this, right, 15 to 11. Hmm? 15 to 11. Opcode, opcode, RIS, RT, RD, shift amount. Funk code, right? But if you're dealing with an I format instruction like add I, the register component that is responsible or that acts as a um, storage location as a destination register is actually RT, the target register. You remember this, right? Opcode, RS, RD, RT. There's no RD. And so the, the question really is then, if, if you're performing some sort of like com computation, if you're making reference to the register file, how, how exactly does the register file get to know which of the registers is the destination? Is the classic example of where max uh, or multiplexers come in handy, right? Um, they help resolve those sort of um, ambiguities, right? <clears throat> so um, back to the same example, just to uh, showcase what actually happens here. Um, imagine a situation where you you're dealing with an add instruction and an add i instruction. You know that for an add instruction, the destination register is going to be uh, bit segment 15 to 11, right? This. But for an add i instruction, the destination is going to be 20 to 16, this. 
this is where the max comes in. Um, the, the multiplexer that actually sits between, um, between uh, uh, so these wires here and the register file determines exactly which input is supposed to go into the register file or which register should act as a destination register. Right, so typically there's a, a control wire here which is uh, appropriately named what? Uh, register destination, uh, register destination, yeah, register destination. And so depending on the value of register destination, um, the multiplexer gets to decide what, which one of these inputs is supposed to act as a, a destination register here. So in this case, if, if the register destination bit is a one, then the value that will serve as a destination register, a la RD, will be 15, will be represented by the bits 15 to 11. If the input value on the other hand coming into the register destination is a zero, then we know that this is, um, uh, then we know that this is an I-formatted instruction, in which case the destination register will be 20 to 16 bits. Right, so you notice here a couple of things happening here. We are determining which of the bit segments are going in, or are, are going to be used as input here, right, depending on what the value of this control signal is, whether it's a one or a zero. And then the other important thing is that the input the input to this multiplexer is um, a five bit value, right, corresponding to either RD or RT. I thought I'd mention that. But if you look at this other multiplexer that sits between the, the register file and the arithmetic logic unit, again, still making reference to the add instruction and the add I instruction, you realize that when you're dealing with, when you're dealing with, um, an add instruction, both inputs are going to come through the, are going to have to come through the, um, the, the register, right? Operand one will come through as, uh, as, as read data one, right? Operand two will be read data two. You remember this, right? What we're talking about here is this here. So if you're dealing with an add, add instruction, the, the values are gonna come through from here, right? But on the other hand, if you're dealing with an add I instruction, you realize that the, uh, the input comes from elsewhere. It's coming from the sign extent. If you have, uh, if you have this sort of uh, situation where this thing is going to be fed to the AL, you are performing a mathematical operation, the first operand will be RT, RA, sorry. The second operand will be the immediate value, which is coming in from the sign extent. Now, of course, it's already been normalized here. It's already 32 bits in size. If you're dealing with an add instruction, the value will come from uh, read data two. So obviously, it makes sense that you, you need a way of trying to determine where that input, the second operand, is coming from. So you need a multiplexer as well. Another classic example where a multiplexer comes in handy. And, and really, uh, if you read up, you notice that you have multiplexers in different components of, the, uh, um, of, of this data path and control um, logical diagram, right? In this case, we're just showing examples using these two things here to try and link to things that we've already discussed. Uh, so, um, but the control line that gets to determine whether, on, whether the input value, the second operand is gonna come through the sign extend or, or the register file is the ALU source, right? Again, it's just a, a control line which signals whether the source uh, is coming in from a register or not. Right. So is it coming in from the immediate value, sign extend, or is it coming through from uh, register source number two, right? Another key takeaway point here, in, in this particular example, you notice that um, the input values are 32 bits in size here because of the type of data we are dealing with, right? For this particular multiplexer, these values that are going into the multiplexer are 32 bits in size. For this multiplexer, the values coming in are five bits in size. So takeaway point here is it depends on where exactly that multiplexer is sitting and the purpose of the multiplexer. In this case, we're trying to determine 
what register <coughs> is going to act as a destination. And when we're dealing with registers, we, we are talking about five bits here, zero up to 31, right? In this case, we are dealing with actual data. When we're dealing with actual data, we're dealing with 32 bits here, right? Yes? It's not the name of the multiplex, it's the name of the bit that gets to determine what, uh, uh, what the multiplexer is going to do. Because you see the, the multiplexer, these two maxes here, they take in two input values, either zero or one, right? If the, for this particular one, if the input value is zero, then, if the, sorry, if, if, the, if, the, um, if the input value is zero, then the value that's going to be output is related to this line here, which is this segment. If the input value coming in from here is a one, then the value that is going to be uh, uh, inputted into here is this coming from here. When you come uh, to this particular max, if the value coming in to the ALU source is a one, then you know that you're dealing with the immediate value. If it's a zero, then you're dealing with a register input, the value that's in the register. So the ALU source is not the name of the multiplexer, no. no they're all multiplexers, I guess, but it doesn't have a name. Yes? No, no, it's not like that. It's um, what best way to do this? It's it's like we're making it. It's like we're making a. <clears throat> it's not exactly the same, but it's I guess it's similar. It's like what we were doing when we were dealing with branches, right? We said um, we. We said you, you get to branch depending on whether the condition is true. In this case, in this case, we branch, we branch to the line associated with the zero if the value is zero. If the value coming into here is zero, there's a control line that comes here, guys. There's a value that comes here which will either be a zero or a one. And there's a value that comes through the um, reaches the destination control signal which is either a zero or a one. If the value is zero, then take this route. If the value is one, then use this route. This is how it works. If the value is zero here, then you know that the so if the value coming through here, through the ALU source bit, the value can either be one or zero. If the value is, uh, is zero, then you know that the, um, the value that's going to be fed to the ALU has to come from the register file. If the value is a one, then you know that that value must come through the immediate value. That's how it works. I don't know if that makes sense, but hey, okay. Are we, are we on the same page? Mm -hmm. Even though we're not flipping the books here, but, uh, oh, we're flipping the slides. Are we on the same slide? Now, the, the next instruction to look at here, I think we should wrap this up, right? We, are, we should uh, move on to the next thing. Life goes on. Um, we're looking at like specific hardware components. I heard someone make a comment. Uh, it's like, for those of you that don't understand, you say no, right? You're saying no, he doesn't understand. What, what don't you understand? Why are we not on the same page? Sorry? Lost in the whirlwind, right? Uh, sorry? Where are you lost? Sorry? Who else is lost? Who, who is not lost? Lighton is not lost, uh, and there's a lot of other people that are not lost, that's good. Uh, <laughs> it looks like uh, we are on this, uh, we almost, we can take this offline, I can walk you through this process afterwards then. 
And again, guys, here, we're, we're not really going into the gory details of, we're simplifying things here, we're abstracting the data path here, just because we are not, um, we're not studying how to, to build computer systems. We're just trying to gain an appreciation of how those three different types of instructions get to be processed by the CPU. Why? Because the next lecture series discusses the um, logical entities that get to implement the, the movement, right? So it turns out that everything in a computer is, is done using gates. That's all. No ones and zeros are just gates, right? So we're trying to set the stage for that. So we have abstracted things here. Abstraction is so nice. Um, but what about the, the two segments of the J format instruction? And the question is, how exactly is that processed, right? Uh, and, and really the best way of thinking about this is um, of trying to remind yourself that fundamentally what the purpose of uh, an instruction like the, the J instruction, the jump instruction, is you're trying to specify which address in memory you should jump to. Right, so again, taking into account that uh, really the potential addresses that you can jump to in memory is going to be two to the power 26. Lord, those are a lot of locations, memory locations, right? But that's besides the point. The thing to remind yourself is that the address that you need to jump to needs to be 32 bits in size. It has to be 32 bits, right? But it turns out that the target address, because of the limitation of the 32 bits that you're working with, the target address is always represented by 26 bits. The other six bits are represented by the operator itself, so J, JL, for instance, right? Is represented by these six bits. So the question then is, how do we arrive at the 32-bit representation of these 26 bits, right? What happens behind the scenes? It turns out that there's just two simple steps that are involved, right? Um, smart people that came before us, probably some of them are still alive, uh, figured out that you can achieve this by doing two, two, by just performing two steps, right? First step is you shift the address by two to the left. Uh, essentially, it's the same as just adding or padding it with two zeros. Uh, other people say it's the same as multiplying by four. It turns out that when you have a value and you, and, and you, and you, you add two zeros to it, you end up with, you end up with, the resulting value that you end up with is going to be a multiple of four. I don't know if this is making sense. So whatever memory address you have, once you pad it with zero, it will be a multiple of four. And that's your goal, right? Because memory is byte addressable or word aligned. So it doesn't matter that you, you are padding two zeros in front of the 22-bit number that you have here. So first step, <clears throat> First step is you, uh, you add two bits to the 22, 26 bits here, right? Because you end up with a value that's divisible by four, which is the goal here, because those memory things, and the lady is not here. Someone was asking me, oh, in the book, they're saying uh, uh, when you have memory address here um, and the value, like so. <coughs> uh, two. And the, the, her question, she was trying to find out what the question mark was, but, but what I'm saying is that uh, when you add the two zeros, you, you'll be making reference to chunks of, of four, essentially, which is a goal, because memory, memory is counted using what? Using one byte, right? One byte, one byte, one byte, one byte. It's byte addressable, which is why we're saying a number a constant, for instance, a constant like this, if you can figure out what this is, is going to be represented using one, two, three, four bytes. This is memory. Why? Because this has to be 32 bits in size. Okay. So, first step, add two zeros and try this out. Look at it, the, the, the initial address that you start working with when you're, you are using Qt spin. Uh, 0x004, 4, 4, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, I think. Right, this is usually the starting point. 
I think uh, the PC, the program counter is initially set to that. All the different addresses that you are, you are going to be working with are going to be uh, uh, multiples of four beginning from that particular entry point, right? So, I don't know. Uh, right, so that's the first step. But you notice that once you, you add, you pad two zeros in front here, you end up with 26 bits. Question is, how, where do you get the other four bits? Because for you to move from 28 to 32, you need four more bits. And there's a simple way around. You add uh, the higher order bits from the program counter to the uh, value, and then you have your 32-bit register, right? So putting it all together, you add the four most significant bits from the program counter. So you get the value in the program counter, whatever address is in the program counter, right? It's going to be represented using 32 bits, right? One, two, three, 32. You get the, the beginning four bits, and then you pad them to the 28 bits that you've derived after adding two zeros. Two steps that you're doing here. Step number one, like add, add two bits or multiply by four, in which case you have, so you initially have 26 bits. Uh, add two <coughs> zeros and then prefix with program counter, PC. The last four higher order bits from the program counter. Hmm? The beginning four. Higher order bits are the beginning. Remember, I think of this from the perspective of, uh, the values are always left to right, right? Hmm? Didn't come with the dust today, but I did. The values are always left to right. So when we're saying we get the higher order bits, the higher order bits are the most significant bits which are at the beginning. When you have a number, one, zero, 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 blah, 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 the higher order bits we're talking about are on the left, leftmost side, right? So simple process, guys, and I, I swear it's not, um, it's not um, permanent marker here, I think it's just a dust. So putting it together here, this is what's happening here. You have your 26 bits as input, and remember, these 26 bits are coming from bit position zero up, uh, 25 up to zero because 31 to 26 are represented by the operation, which can either be J or JL, for instance, right? So the 25, the 25 to zero bits uh, segments, which is 26 in total, uh, you first of all sh shift left, right? Shift left essentially is just like pad two zeros in front, just add two zeros in front, in front right? Or multiply by, is it by four. Um, you get 28 bits, and then using the value in the program counter, you just snatch the four leftmost bits or the four uh, high order bits from the value in the program counter, the th from the 32 bits in the program counter, get the beginning four bits, and then just pad them to the uh, 28 bits, and then lo and behold, you come up with the address where you have to jump to. And once you have that value, you know that all you're doing is you're fetching you're saying jump to this instruction, make reference to that particular instruction. At that, at, at that point, you're making reference to what? Instruction memory, right? Simple, but uh, smart people have kind of done this before us, right? Okay, um, but I thought I snuck in a few things. Those of you that have, uh, have, have accessed these slides, you notice that there's just a few minor changes here. I decided to sneak in. Last time we didn't really talk so much about these so-called control signals. Um, you notice that in literature, there's typically these different control signals that are made reference to, and we've only, we've only referred to a few select ones, right? Things like ALU source, ALU op, for instance, and register destination. But it turns out that there are a number of control signals that are fed into these different hardware components. And depending on the value of the control signal, uh, certain actions are performed, right? Uh, just, I just thought, I mean, to kind of mention what some of these things do, even if we didn't uh, discuss them. Uh, we know what the AOU op does, really, just signals what, what sort of operation should be performed, add, sub, or something, right? And, or, or. the ALU um, is, is uh, the AOU source is, uh, is, is, is the value that f feeds into the multiplexer that sits between the register file and, and the ALU itself, and it gets to determine where the source that's going to go to the ALU is. Right? So depending on that value, the source can either come from the sign extent or from the immediate value or from the register. 
right? Um, and so certain control signals like the, the branch control signal, which determines um, which brand, branch address you're going to be working with, right? When you're making reference to those branch operations we're talking about, so B, E, B, B and E, B, Q, um, uh, B, G, T, I guess, even though it's a pseudo instruction, right? So things like jump, uh, which, which jump address needs to be loaded, the memory destination, gets to specify um, which particular, um, hmm. Right, so whether, whether or not you're going to be writing to, which, which particular destination in memory you're going to write the data to. Um, um, memory read, uh, whether or not the operation involves reading a value from data memory. Remember, we're dealing with instruction memory and data memory. Um, mem to register, uh, where you're going to write the data if, if the operation involves writing data to a temporal register, right? Like um, the add operation, for instance. Um, and memory write, whether the operation you're working with involves writing data to memory. It's not always the case that the, the operation that you're working with involves writing data to memory, like add, for instance. You're not writing anything to memory, you're just writing the resulting output to registers, right? But things like uh, store weight, the store weight instruction will eventually have to write data that you're working with to memory, to RAM, right? Um, so yeah, uh, putting it together, I mean, this is the so-called data path that, uh, um, that you find in literature, I guess. Um, and if you go to the, the book that's uh, in the references, you realize that um, in certain instances, there's a more, detailed, um, a more detailed diagram that shows you the specific path that the different types of instructions get to follow, right? Yes, sir. Mem to reg and what? So this this get to gets to determine which register you're going to write uh, you're going to write to from memory right data from memory going into the register. This uh, memory destination specifies where in memory um, the destination in memory where the data is going to be fetched from or read from, essentially. Come again? Mm -hmm. No. So maybe this destination is making reference to RAM here. And the add, add operation doesn't make reference to RAM, does it? The add operation is not, you're not dealing with RAM at that point. In, when, you're adding two, when you're adding two values and putting the result into a register, you're just dealing with registers. You're not dealing with memory at that point in time. Um, the only instructions that might, uh, might involve uh, reading or writing data from memory are things like, and we didn't cover so many of these instructions. So load weight, store weight, for instance. Uh, what else is there? But most of the things that we, we, we kind of covered have nothing to do with memory, which is, which is why, if you remember, most of the instructions that we were, we were looking at were implicitly adding values to, we're making the assumption that the values are already in registers, are already on the CPU. Right, so, um, yeah. Okay. Guys, I hope this makes some sense now. You know what happens to a, a computer, um, you know what happens when you install software and every time you run that piece of software, it gets to, it, to it, it, when you run that piece of software, it's loaded into RAM, you should explain this to people now is loaded into RAM, and then from RAM, 
the individual instructions associated with that program get to be executed by the CPU. The way that they're executed by the CPU is determined by the format of the instruction. If you're dealing with MIPS, whether it be an R format instruction, an I format instruction, or a J format instruction. And so the path really, the execution path followed is, is determined by what, what is actually happening. Granted, a machine like this or my smartphone doesn't make use of the MIPS architecture. It's a different sort of architecture. So the moment you're making reference to diff different type of um, instruction set architecture, the data paths that you're dealing with are different from what we've discussed. But fundamentally, this is what happens. Now that we know how these instructions are executed, next year we can happily start uh, learning how to write these instructions using you know, high-level programming languages. This is one of the goals of this course, right? Yes, sir. Sorry? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you mean the only component that's manipulated is the program counter? PC, ADA, PC, ADA instruction memory in the component that does the, the shift two. Sorry? No, thank you very much. No, there's no, you're not making reference to the um, register file here. Think about this for a second. Uh, J format instructions, J, uh, jump and link. Is there anywhere in those two instructions where you get to make reference to a register? Is there anywhere in those two instructions where you get to write to a register or read from a register? No. Nope. So this is interesting. But again, we've abstracted things here, guys, right? The, the, um, the, the thing is that um, this part where I was saying, uh, oh no, you add something. It turns out that we, we're abstracting things here, but the, ask yourself, how exactly are these four higher order bits added to the 20, 28 bits? There has to be an adder somewhere, right? So there's like an adding component. But fundamentally, the key components that are involved is just what we've spoken about. Uh, there's so many things in there that, that we haven't discussed just because they're not relevant to our discussion. Are we happy that we now know how um, computer systems work, right? Whether it's a laptop or a mobile device or an embedded system, it's all the same, right? Fetch, decode, execute. And uh, it's not just fetch, decode, execute. There's things that are happening, right? Depending on what sort of instruction is being fetched and decoded and executed. Yes, sir. Oh, no, no, so you, you're, you're making reference to uh, an address that you're going to have to jump to, so essentially you're going to have to fetch that address. Uh, so you're making reference to instruction, mem instruction memory again. Um, good questions. Can we start uh, lecture series number 24, please? As I was looking forward for us to just set the stage and start discussing it. If there are no more questions. Sorry? Where? Oh. <laughs> oh, it's eight. Okay. But we started late, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, we did, right? Hey, where are you going? It's prudent. I, I should get the keys. I'll be locking this place now. Now, then, uh, I don't know. Like, like the one time I found people in the lab, right? And I'm like, but where is he? He he's locked us in. Hey, what if there's a fire, right, in the lab? You die, right? We all die, but um, I will see you on Monday when we start um, digital logic. <laughs> what about the R? What about the R format?
What about the other format is like? We should call mom and dad today and explain to them how instructions are executed. Yes, Esther. Yes, I Where? Why are you saying? Where? Where? Mr. Perry, do you want to try to move? Uh, your, okay, yeah. This is the 93. You remember this? Yeah. So these are the bit segments we're talking about. And I guess, ooh, this. So for I format instruction, we are saying, think about this for a second. We are dealing with an R format instruction, which is this one. Where is the destination register? Beat position 15 to 11. You see this? Yeah, the, bit, the bit positions determine where the data is coming from. Remember these are like, uh, think of them as being wires or buses, right? Where data is being transmitted. And lo and behold, there's no such thing as data. It's just uh, an electric signal, a one or a zero, which is either low or high voltage. Interesting stuff. But when you're dealing with, when you're dealing with an I format instruction, where is the destination? Where is the things you're going to be dumping into the register? Bit position 20 to 16, which is RT. So you need a way of trying to to tell to tell the hardware component say, because this is an I format instruction, write data to the register represented by bit position 20 to 16. Because it's an R format instruction, write data to the register represented by bit position 15 to 11. But how do you decide this? You decide this using a max, a multiplexer. Yes? When before Questions are nice, this right? Is this is using the jump instruction. Jump instruction, let's go. And, and guys, have you noticed that most of the things we've been doing are three, right? Three instructions, three main components of the phenomenon like architecture. There has to be something special about the three, I don't know. Uh, three, three minutes late, but I don't know. Um, not three minutes, I don't know, but the jump, where are we? Here. Ooh. No, this is like, explain. Here. Go again. Yes, here. Uh -huh. Yes, here. <laughs> the way, before it enters, right, there are 26 bits. And then you add two. There are 26. Yes, you add two, right? 28. You give you 28. And then you add four. You add four. <laughs> you add 32. <laughs> Oh. 28, 29, 30, 31, 30. You should use your fingers for 28. 29, 30, 31. <laughs> I do that I myself. Know, but I, but I, but I, for some reason, I thought I was saying 28 again. Yeah. No. Oh, when you add. That's yeah, no. Yeah, the, the, the goal here is uh, you want to come up with an address that's going to be 32 bits yeah. in size. Right. We've come full circle. We are, we are done. You know, we are done discussing. <laughs> <laughs> we are done discussing MIPS and everything else. We are moving forward. We are going to the next layer of abstraction and next Monday. And I'm really excited. Excited because we're almost done. And I'll be happy. Probably put it on my CV. I told people how, how computers work or something. Yeah, the CA is bad because you were going parting, right? Instead of reading. Now that uh, disaster has struck, you know, there's no going back. What can we do? Nothing. Yes. Oh, yes. No, maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I shouldn't have used these numbers. Let's give <laughs> Let me go back to, uh, I want to point you to our, the book that we're using, right? Go and read, go, go, go back and read. Uh, the reason I'm pointing you to this is when you fail to make sense out of what I'm going to, to refer you to, please come and see me. You must come and see me. I like it when people come and see me, but you should come and see me. Uh, when we're discussing about uh, Indianness, right? Remember this? Someone came with a question. 
where they were saying, oh, this, this is what I was referring to. They came with a different sort of question and when I was explaining why, why, we, um, why we need to, uh, why we need to add two zeros and uh, add the pieces so that we have 32, I was trying to remind you to say, if you have a value, a memory location, and, and you, you, whenever you, God, I should go and re-education, like in China, they send you to re-education camps, right? They should go and teach me how to teach because I, think about this for a second. One's place, two's place. <coughs> Fourth place. Your goal by putting two zeros here will ensure that whatever value you are working with is a multiple of four. The reason you want that is because memory is byte addressable. All of these things here are divisible by four. Think about this. Go, go and check. Right? All of these things here, these values you are looking at here, these are multiples of four. That is the goal when you're trying to reconcile that, that 20, those 26, the 26 bit long target address. You want to get to a state. You want to get to a, a, a state where you are working with 32 bits, but those 32 bits have to be multiples of four because you are making reference to a memory location, and memory is byte addressable. Multiples of four. So this is eight times four. That's 32. What? Where? Oh yes, yes. When I said 34 here, 32 here. Yeah. So this would be like. Uh, yeah, these are multiples of four, so this would be like one, if this was zero, this is four, eight, you know. No, 16. <laughs> no, no, this is worrying now, if we can't count. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes. We discussed Little Indian and Big Indian. What are you talking about? Any discussion, we've had multiple discussions about Little Indian and Big Indian. When I'm giving you examples in class, when I gave you certain examples in class, I was showing you the memory in QT spin, the data segment, trying to show you to say this character, do you notice why these numbers are flipped over? It's because you're using a certain type of Indianness, which is why the number represents, if you're working with ICT and you convert this using the ASCII table and you come up with like the hexadecimal representation of these things, you notice that they're somehow represented in a very awkward manner. So it's hard to read. It's because they're going in a certain direction, right? Lowest location to maybe highest location. We discussed this. We've been talking about this for, for weeks, not months. Um, now, guys, uh, <laughs> uh, I think I'm going to do ICT to learn how to use Excel. No. But uh, <laughs> this is more interesting. The, the interesting thing about what you do, on a serious note, the, the cool thing about what, what we're doing right now is once you understand this, you can do pretty much most of the things to do with the low level stuff associated with computers actually, without a problem, right? They reminded us that when you're done teaching, you must clean the board. Because I, I was ne I, I, I've not been taught how to teach, I, I've been leaving it dead, right? So now I don't, but. <laughs> Are we okay, guys? See you when you see me. Look out for the quiz today at 23.59. <laughs> but anyway. It's about your data No, procedures. <laughs>